Well, church, today is the World Series, the Super Bowl, the Masters, the World Cup. It is everything rolled into, get, into one for the Christians because today is the day that our King Jesus won. Is that good news to anyone today? Throughout history, the church has had this declaration on these moments. On Easter morning, there's a phrase that is used repeatedly, and I would like for us as one family to join together with over two billion people. Get that in your mind for just a moment here. Two billion people right now on every continent in every language, in every conceivable home or church or location, every 2,000 voices today are declaring that He is risen. So I'm going to ask you, church, will you join me in this? As it's been said for centuries, I will say He is risen if you will respond with He is risen indeed. And we're going to do this a couple times, so just get that voice ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. If you're a guest with us, welcome. Today's sort of a big day for those of us who call ourselves Christ followers, and we hope that you've been warmly welcomed. Uh, hopefully, you found a seat in here, and to all of our guests who are joining us in the cafe and the other f- overflow locations, welcome. We're glad you're here, as well as those of you who are uh, out because you're sick or out of town, welcome online. We're just so glad that you're here today, and what a good time it is to celebrate our Savior. We're going to dive into a text here in just a moment from Mark chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, grab it. Turn with me to Mark chapter 16. That's in the New Testament. The Bible is divided into two halves, effectively. The first half we call the Old Testament. It's everything that comes before the life of Jesus. And then the New Testament is the life, death, resurrection of Jesus and the story of his church, the people of God. So you've got those before and then Jesus and onward. And so Mark is right after The beginning of the New Testament is the second of four Gospels or good news accounts of the life of Jesus. And we're going to read a passage there. This is Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. When the Sabbath was over. Now, let me just explain. The Sabbath was the seventh day of the week. It was on Saturday. It was the Jewish holy day, the day of rest. You did not do work. You did not uh, do extra activities. It was a day to pause, to ponder, and remember that God is in control. By the way, many of us need a moment each week to remember that it is God who is God and not us. Amen? When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, also mother of Jesus, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they went They were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Can I get an amen on that one? (laughs) They were alarmed, but he says, don't be alarmed, too late. You are looking for Jesus, the Messiah, from Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. If you want to title this message this morning, the title is simply When the Rock Talked. Everybody say this with me, When the Rock Talked. This is a story, well, let me start this way, shall we? Have you ever been somewhere that you really weren't supposed to be? Can can, can I see some hands? If you've ever been somewhere, maybe you didn't mean to, maybe you didn't know, 
Or maybe you did and then you got caught, but have you ever been somewhere that you were not supposed to be? Anyone want to be honest on Easter morning? Good choice. You're in church, it's Easter. I think we've all had a moment where we have been somewhere we weren't really supposed to be, maybe not intentionally, but it just sort of happens. A few years ago, Lindsay and I were in Gatlinburg at a marriage retreat with a bunch of friends, and during one of the pauses between sessions, a bunch of us went to lunch at a local restaurant and had great conversation, great food, and as tends to be my pattern near the end of the meal before we left, I, because I have a bladder the size of a two-year-old child, I said, hey, I need to go, I'll be, I'll be back in a minute. So I get up, I excuse myself, and I go to the men's room. I go in, I walk in, and I don't know, guys, you'll, you'll get this. Ladies, you may not catch this real well, but guys, you'll understand that when you walk into a men's room, not trying to be crass, just trying to help you understand, when you walk in, you look for urinals, correct? I won't explain that. Talk to your husbands at home. But a urinal isn't for the men. And I walk in, and I thought it was weird because this, this men's room didn't have any urinals, but I thought, okay, no big deal. <laughs> I walk over. I go into one of the stalls. I lock the stall. I finish up, and, and right then, as I'm about to open the stall, the door to the bathroom opens, and I don't hear the sound of sneakers. I hear the sound of high heel shoes. And the problem is, it's not just one pair of high heel shoes that I hear, but it's like a flock of women who are coming in. And it's not only that they're coming in, but they're evidently continuing a conversation that they began before they got up that morning because they were deep in it. They were laughing. They were talking. <laughs> Everything was great except for the dude hiding in the stall. <laughs> and, and, and listen, guys, let, let's just be honest here. When a man goes to the bathroom, does he go with a group of guys? What's the right answer, fellas? No. Ladies, you are social, social, social. Just so you know, the rule for men, if you happen to enter when another man enters, there is a strict no talking policy in the bathroom. Eyes to the front, never to the side. It is you, yourself, and God. That is it. But you all come in together, so I'm going, oh no, what do I do? I'll wait until they leave. <sighs> I should have brought a pillow. <laughs> They're about to finish. I think, okay, now's my chance. I'm going to make a break for it. As I start to swing the door open, the door opens again, and now not four or five, but like the whole restaurant full of women walk in, and they're like, let's continue the party in here. And so you get to that point, guys, after, you know, the lunch crowd has left and um, dinner has already been served and you go, what do I do now? And so I thought, well, do I just kind of make a break for it, you know, look down, not make eye contact? Or, or do you do sort of the bold move, run out and say, sorry, and just keep going? Well, what do you do? So I sort of did both. Sorry. I ran out. My wife's waiting for me. I don't even stop. I just keep going. I'm, I'm like all the way to the convention center. Have you ever been somewhere that you're not supposed to be. D do you understand that Easter is a story about things not being where they're supposed to be? It's all about things or people being where they're not supposed to be. The story begins in chapter 16 with a crucified Christ. There are three ladies who are now going to the tomb of Jesus. Now, they know what you and I know. He wasn't supposed to die. He had told them that he was going to rescue people. He was the great liberator. How do you liberate if you die? And so Easter morning is a story of Jesus not being where he's supposed to be. They think, so they get up and they go to the tomb. Now, there are three ladies. These three women are followers of Jesus. Mary Magdalene was, was freed from demon possession by Jesus. Then you have Mary, the mother of James. This is also Jesus' mother. And a third disciple, a woman named Salome, who followed and loved Jesus. And they come to finish preparation of Jesus' body because there just had not been enough time on Friday to finish the preparation. In Jewish custom, when a person died, they would take the body and they would prepare it in multiple stages. First, they would take the body and they would wrap the entire body in strips of cloth, very tightly, almost like a mummy, but they would do legs individually, then the torso, then arms. Then they would take pounds and pounds of spices and they would pack it in between the crevices of all of the strips of cloth so that as the body decayed, this would mask the smell. 
And then finally, they would lay the body in the tomb or where they were preparing to bury it, and they would lay a napkin or a cloth over the face. They would not wrap it tight, but they would put a cloth. And then they would take, and this is the part the women came to do, a mixture of oils and spices and pour it over the body, a final anointing of the dead. But on the way, they realize they've got a problem. See, just as they had been planning to go because they were coming on Sunday, because on Friday, there just wasn't enough time. There had been a man named Joseph, a rich guy from Arimathea. He and another man named Nicodemus who came to meet Jesus at night. Nicodemus, the original Nick at night. They come. How many of you understand that one? (laughs) Childhood. And so... They go, they get permission from Pilate to take Jesus' body off the cross because you need to understand that a poor person cannot afford a proper burial, at least not in a tomb, but Joseph was very rich. Jesus, we're told, was very poor. Jesus died on Friday at 3 p.m., we're told. Problem is, Sabbath begins at 6 p.m. They have three hours to get him ready, get him off the cross, get him to the tomb, get him wrapped, get him prepared, get him set and the stone in place, and then get back to their homes before 6 p.m. Sabbath, three hours. There's not enough time, and so the women wait until after Sabbath, Saturday, and on Sunday morning, they come, they're prepared, they're ready, and they prepare the spices. But on their way, they, they remember a slightly important detail, don't they? And can you imagine the moment? One of the ladies, I'm not sure who, but one of the ladies looks to the others and goes, uh-oh, who is going to roll that great big rock out of the way? What are we going to do? I mean, it was one of those moments that they have everything ready and they forget one of the most important parts. By the way, have you ever forgotten something really important? How many of you were left at church or a supermarket because your parents forgot you? Praise God, we're not the only ones who have been scarred. That's great. But I mean, maybe you're like, you know, you, you're prepping for that big trip, right? You've, you've got everything ready. You're going to go to Disney World. You're going to maybe go to grandma's house, granddad's house. Or you're going to go to this place or that place. You got everything ready, right? You got it all ready. So you've got the car packed. You've got the toys set. You've got the clothes, suitcase, everything. You get in the car 10 miles away and you go... We forgot the kids. We, we forgot something important here. That is what has happened here. But you need to understand, it's not simply because they forgot like they should have remembered, but this was an unusual thing to have a rock in front of a tomb. Again, let's just talk first century. When you buried someone in a tomb, only the wealthy could do that. Everyone else was buried underground, but if you were a wealthy person, you'd have a tomb Tombs were not very large. Usually they were relatively small entrances, maybe five feet, and then there was just enough space inside for one body to be laid. And so what you do is you put a body in and you'd allow it and let time take its course until there were only bones left. You'd take the body or the bones out, put it in a small box called an ossuary, and you'd keep the bones. You'd then be able to reuse the tomb. So because of this, they would usually have a wooden door in front of the tomb for easy use. A stone is very heavy, very big, very difficult to get in and out. A door, not a stone, so we can forgive the women for forgetting, but they realize we, we can't get to Jesus. I mean, we, we know where he is. We know what we want to do, but we can't get To Jesus, quick question, have you ever had a moment where you wish you could get to God, but you felt like there was something in your way? I think if we live long enough, we we all kind of hit that moment, don't we? And they realize they don't know how to get to Jesus, and so they're going, by the way, when we talk about the rock, is this what we're talking about, church? No, this is the rock. Let's just describe the rock for a moment here. It's kind of a big thing. About six feet tall, 12 inches thick, 2,000 pounds. It's not something easily moved. And it would have been positioned in front of most likely this location. This is called the Garden Tomb. It's in Jerusalem. Really, there are two locations in Jerusalem where we think Jesus may have been laid to rest. My mom and dad were in Jerusalem not too long ago, and their guide told them there were multiple locations, and he was only going to take them to one, but he looked at those that he was taking and said, hey, but don't worry. They're both the same because they're both empty. He's not here. 
So they get there, they come to the tomb, and, and, and they're, they're trying to figure out what to do. So, so let's see if we can sort of describe this rock a little bit more to, to get some help here. Guys, can you, uh, can you sh- bring my rock in for me here? By the way, don't we have some buff guys at Clear Creek? Man, look, and they're brothers, no less. All right, just go ahead and put it right here, if you will. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Excellent, excellent. All right, can you give them a hand? (laughs) So now, get the picture. This is what they're concerned with. It took many men to roll into place. If you look closely on the picture, you'll notice there's a trough in front of the doorway. Do you see that trough space? They would actually wedge the stone in there, and they'd roll it in place. And the reason it was put in place is because the religious leaders, those who had Jesus executed, were afraid that the disciples might come, open the door, take Jesus' body, and claim he had been raised from the dead. So they told Pilate this concern. Pilate had a stone placed and then a cord placed over the stone with his seal on both sides. By the way, how many of you have ever seen one of those tamper-proof seals? You know, if it's off the top of the container, someone has been inside. They had that in the first century as well. And so they're wondering, what do, what do we do? How do we get to Jesus? How do we get past the rock? My question this morning is, what's your rock? What is it that you are thinking? I just, I, I just, I don't know how to get past it. And, and here's the reality. You don't have to be a Christ follower. You don't even have to believe in God to know there are things that you have done for which you cannot pay or get around. And the truth is, we all have different rocks in this room. I don't know what your rock is. Maybe this morning, if we were just to put a few things on the board here, maybe some of us would say that my rock is addiction. Maybe you'd say that there's something that you started socially or maybe something you began in secret or something that you did once or twice, but it kind of grew, became this habit, became this compulsion, and now you just can't get rid of it. It's a monkey on your back. You say, I don't know how to get past this rock. For others of us, it may not be addiction. Maybe it's, maybe it's just some secret sin, something that we do in private. We don't think it hurts anyone else, but in those moments where we pause, we go, it's hurting someone, it's hurting me. And so maybe this morning, Your rock is a secret sin, and for others, maybe that secret sin is you had an abortion, and you go, you know, I can't take that back, I can't get around it, I don't know what to do, how do I get past this, what do I do? And so you'd say, there's no way to roll that rock away, it's it's a part of my story, It's, it's defining who I am, what do I do for others still, maybe it's adultery, you broke a vow, you... You broke a heart, you did something in a moment you shouldn't have, and so now you just go, again, I can't undo what I did. And so you'd say, your rock is adultery. And then for others, maybe, maybe you'd think, you know, man, I, it's not that. I just, I got a temper that just won't quit. I, I'm just quick to use my words. I've harmed people. I've broken relationships. I have children who won't talk to me. It's been years or a spouse who left me because of the way that I always blew up or I lost a job after job because of the way that I tend to use my words, short fuse and a big bang. And so you say maybe your rock is your temper and then for others you go, man, it's, it's the fact that I have just broken trust. I have been dishonest and I, you know, maybe you've even tried to rectify it, but you go, I just can't. Take it back, it's, it's done. And you'd say, your rock is lying. And for others, you might put another word up here. You might say, it's just regret. Or it's that thing, that moment. We're skipping ahead here. <laughs> but the ladies realize they can't move what is there. So we get to verse four, and thank God there is a verse four, Amen. Because in verse 4, go ahead and put this up, Clint. Verse 4 says, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, notice this phrase, had been rolled away. Past tense. They get to the place of their great concern and the great problem, the barrier is already gone. Now, quick question. When was the stone rolled away? 
Was it before they got there? Yeah. Maybe it even happened before they asked the question, what will we do? How will we move it? Was it already gone? Perhaps even that morning before they got up, God had already rolled the rock away. Here's what is so interesting. The very first sermon spoken was not by human lips, but by an inanimate object, a rock, because it was not where it was supposed to be. It said, Jesus is risen. And although you do not know what you will face, he is already working. In fact, while they were worrying, God was already working. Although you may be worrying about what you have done and you struggle with how to get past it, and you, I don't know what to do. The first thing you need to know from Easter is simply this. While you're worrying, God is already working. He knows things that are going to happen tomorrow that you don't know about, and he's already working in your tomorrow. He knows things that are going to happen this week or month or this year. He knows things that are going to happen that you have no idea, and you will begin to worry and wonder. But he says, listen, listen, listen. While you're worrying, I'm already working. I am already at work. Here's the great news of the gospel. Many people think the great news is that we can somehow work our way to God, but the great news of the gospel is not that you can get to God, but that God through Jesus Christ came to you. He moved the stone, the barrier, the thing that you say, I can't, I don't know how, I don't, what do I do? He says, while you are worrying, I am already working. This is the beautiful message of Easter, church. But but we miss it, don't we? There's this interesting phrase, did you catch it? In this verse, notice what it says, but when they looked up, everybody say, looked up. Oh my goodness. Come on, let's do an Easter version of looked up. Ready? They, what, church? When they looked up, here's the reality. Most of us are looking down at what we've done. We're looking down at the sin, at the situation, at the problem, at what we keep running into. We keep looking at the situation. Church, it does not matter what God has done if you never look to Him for help. Easter is a message of hope, but we must look up. In fact, if you want to write this down, church, we just need to raise our gaze from our situation to our Savior. You need to raise your gaze. Some of us have practiced looking down. You're so focused looking down, you don't see what God is doing. We need to practice spinal alignment where we look up from our situation to our Savior. And then, of course, here's the great part. By the way, if the rock's not in place, what are you going to check if you're one of the ladies? Uh, Is the body still there? I mean, what's happened? And so they do what anyone would do. They go in, they look, and there's a dude there. It's not Jesus' body. It's just some body. And this one's alive. And he's dressed in white. The other gospels will tell us that this wasn't just some man, but he was an angel, a messenger of God. And I love this, they're they're alarmed, but he says, don't be alarmed. By the way, I love how in Scripture, whenever we're told don't be alarmed, it's always too late for the person, they're already alarmed. Did you know that the phrase, do not be alarmed, do not fear, don't be afraid, or one of those variations is the most common command in all of the Bible? It's used 365 times. One time for every day of the year. Because I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded not to worry. And he says, let me tell you why you don't worry. You don't worry because, notice this, he is not here. The only reason I am able to not worry is not because I have money in the bank or I have healthy kids or a happy marriage or because things are going well in this area of life or that area. Church, listen. Whatever you have today can be taken from you tomorrow. The only reason not to fear is if the tomb is empty. For in that moment, he declares that death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. Satan could not be victorious over him. Your past does not define you. This is why we are not afraid, church, because the tomb is empty. And so the angel says, but listen, listen, this is good news. 
Don't keep it to yourself. Notice this phrase, he says, verse 7, but go, tell the disciples and Peter. Now, why does Peter get a shout out? Of all the disciples, now there are different theories. One theory is because Mark, the author, got his material from Peter, that Peter may have actually been kind of saying, hey, and listen, could, could you make sure to include that little detail that he said my name specifically? Yeah, go tell the disciples and, yeah, P, E, T, yeah, okay, you got it? Okay, good. Maybe that's it. I don't think that's why. Of all the ones to include, why does he say and Peter, or even more importantly, why does he use that name? Is that his birth name, church? What's his birth name? It's Simon. This is not his birth name. This is his nickname given to him by whom? Jesus. Peter, it comes from the Greek word petros, which means rock. Do you remember that moment where Jesus says, who do people say I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the chosen one. You're the big kahuna. That's the Josh Diggs version. And because of that, because of that, Jesus says, you are not Simon. You are the rock. You are Peter. Notice this. Peter is not feeling very rock-like this morning. Last time he saw Jesus alive, Jesus was on trial, and Peter was out in the surrounding courtyard, listening in to the trial, trying to stay out of the way, but to hear what's going on when some people notice Peter and they say, you are one of his followers. And Peter goes, no, I'm not. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And then this young girl, probably 14 or so years of age, goes, oh yeah, I know you. You're one of his followers. Peter, the rock, the man, crumples under the intense interrogation of a 14-year-old girl. And he goes, man, I'm not the rock anymore. I'm just a failure. Have you been in that place? I gave my life to Jesus. I followed him. I did this. I, you know, I, and then something happens. You go, I'm, I'm, I'm just not that anymore. Or I, I don't. He doesn't say, go tell Simon. He says, you go tell Peter. Because I gave him that name, and nothing takes away the name that I give you, Jesus says. In fact, if you want to write this down, last thing. Church, you are not defined. Friends, you are not defined. Friend, you are not defined by your great regret. You are defined by by your great Redeemer. If you are in Christ, the old is gone. Your former name, your former allegiance, your former identification, all the past sins, the great rocks of your past are not what defines you. God is saying, if I can use an inanimate object to proclaim good news, I can use a whole bunch of rocks, of Peters, who are broken, who have flawed, who have messed up, but I have redeemed them. I can use you. Easter says this, your story's not over. You are not defined by your greatest regret. You are defined by your great Redeemer. That is why we celebrate. Anyone here this morning defined by Jesus Christ? He is my Redeemer. He is yours. And if he's not, he can be.